Good evening. I'm Caroline Janey, Director of the NOW Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2021 Signature Conference. We are especially excited about this year's conference for two reasons. First, because we were unable to hold our conference last year, we are especially grateful that all of our panelists were willing to save the date and join us again this year. Second, we are extremely excited to be launching the NOW Center's much anticipated website, Black Virginians in Blue. And tonight's program will focus on just that, focus on the website. We'll hear first from Elizabeth Varon about some of the stories that this project has revealed. And then we'll turn to Will Kurtz to learn more about the website itself. Before we begin our program, however, I have a few housekeeping items. First, I'd like to offer a very special thanks to Will Kurtz, Kevin Caprice, and Brian Newman for all of their administrative and technical support. Our NOW Center programming simply could not happen without them. I'd also like to make everyone aware that there is closed captioning available. You simply need to click on the CC button on your Zoom controls and that should be available to you. Finally, at the end of our two lectures, we will answer some questions from the audience. And please be sure to use the Q&A function rather than the chat function to answer your, or to submit your questions rather. And we will uh, try to get to as many of those as we possibly can. So with that, I am pleased to introduce my colleague, Elizabeth Varon. Professor Varon is the Langbourne M. Williams Professor, Professor of American History and a member of the NOW Center's Executive Council. Her books include a biography of Union spy Elizabeth Van Lu and an account of Lee's surrender to Grant at Appomattox. Her most recent book, Armies of Deliverance, A New History of the Civil War, won the 2020 Gilda Lehrman Lincoln Prize and was named one of, Wall Street, uh, one of the Wall Street Journal's best books of 2020. Please join me in welcoming Professor Varon. Thanks so much. So in the summer of 1887, the Cleveland Gazette, a leading black newspaper of the late 19th century, published a feature story on prominent clergymen who had triumphed over the barriers of slavery and prejudice, as the paper put it. The article recounted the remarkable life of the Reverend Jesse S. Coles of New York's AME Zion Church. Coles had been enslaved in Virginia before the Civil War, and during McClellan's Richmond campaign of 1862, Coles escaped slavery and fled to Union lines, becoming part of a mass exodus of uh, fugitive slaves to the Federal Army during the war. Coles made his way to New England, and in March of 1864, he enlisted in the 29th Connecticut Colored Infantry. Coles then returned to Virginia with this regiment, to the Richmond Front, where he participated in several pitched battles and sustained a crippling gunshot wound in his left arm in the fall of 1864. In an unforgettably dramatic scene, Coles's regiment, the 29th Connecticut, was among the very first infantry units to enter Richmond when Union forces took possession of the rebel capital in April of 1865. After the war, Coles returned to Connecticut and was ordained as a minister, playing a leadership role in church postings across the North. And he worked tirelessly to protest against racial discrimination and to keep the memory of the Union victory alive. In 1885, for example, Coles helped raise funds in New York City's Black churches to erect a monument to the Union general and former president, U.S. Grant, who had just passed away. At the same moment that the Cleveland Gazette was heralding the achievements of Coles, it was also praising the activism of another Civil War veteran named Frank Lee. Like Coles, Lee had been a slave in Virginia and had fled to Union lines and enlisted in the Union Army. Lee's regiment, the 5th Massachusetts Volunteer Colored Cavalry, was the first federal cavalry unit to enter Richmond in triumph in April of 1865. After the war, Frank Lee settled in Cleveland, Ohio, where he established a prominent place in Black civic life, like the Reverend Coles, Lee both protested against Jim Crow repression and worked to preserve the memory of the Civil War as an active member of the venerable veterans group, the Grand Army of the Republic. In 1900, Frank Lee gave a Memorial Day speech, so moving that it was still being quoted by community leaders years later. Lee's message was a straightforward one. Learn from the deeds and valor of the nation's black veterans. Righteousness is the only thing that will bring peace. Through our lives and characters, Lee said, each of us can be a monument to truth. J 
Jesse S. Coles and Frank Lee had more in common than the fact that they were union veterans and community leaders. Both men were born here in Albemarle County, Virginia. Altogether, some 256 men with Albemarle County roots fought in USCT regiments and in the UN, uh, Union Navy. And our new Black Virginians in Blue database and web project, or BVIB for short, charts their journeys. Collectively, their stories demonstrate that we should not equate the South with the Confederacy. In Virginia and across the landscape of the Civil War, Black Southerners hoped for and worked for and gave their lives for Union victory. Their patriotism provided a wellspring of hope on which future activists in the long freedom struggle could draw. So let me start by saying a few words about how we know what we know about the historical sources we use to recover these men's lives. Much of what we'll tell you tonight comes from one very illuminating set of historical documents, namely post-war pension records. Uh, held in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Beginning in 1862, the U.S. federal government offered pensions to Union veterans with war-related disabilities and to the widows and minor children and dependent parents of deceased soldiers. The now Civil War Center has gathered the pension records of some 133 men with Albemarle roots. Now, because pension applicants were required to fill out forms and provide depositions establishing their identities and their experiences and their ailments, and because they so often called in friends and relatives and comrades in arms to vouch for them, these pension files are full of insights into the Civil War era. The men in the BVIB regiments, we learned, fought in a huge range of battles and campaigns in the Crater in 1864, the Appomattox Campaign of 1865. Their service records speak to a, every aspect of military life, recruiting and training, camp life, promotion, desertion, combat, disease, injury, and death. Tonight, I will address the broad ways these men's lives illuminate the freedom struggle in the 19th century. I'll focus on the theme of movement, the displacements of the slave trade, the daring risks of slave flight, the progress of the Union Army across the South, and the post-war journeys of Civil War veterans to build new lives. One theme, more than any other, stands out in the historical sources on Black veterans from Virginia, and that theme is the trauma inflicted by slavery and the slave trade, particularly the trauma of family separation. Take the case, for example, of Matthew Gardner, Conveyed by slave traders from Virginia to Jefferson County, Arkansas on the eve of the Civil War, Gardner went on to fight for freedom as a member of the 69th USCT Regiment. Gardner's pension file makes it possible for us to reconstruct his journey in some detail. He was born into slavery in July of 1847 and grew up on properties owned by the Fretwell family of Albemarle County near Meacham's River Depot. The Fretwells owned more than 20 slaves, and as we can see in their family letters in UVA Special Collections Library, the Fretwells reported to each other regularly on their buying and selling of enslaved men, women, and children. After the family matriarch, Elizabeth Fretwell, died in 1859, her estate was divided up and some of her slaves were consigned to the auction block, among them Matthew Gardner, who at age 12 was separated from his family, taken by slave traders from Virginia, to Arkansas where he was bought by a Dr. John Berry, a, a plantation owner in the Pine Bluff region. When Gardner was sold from Virginia to Arkansas in 1859, he entered what historians have called the great jugular vein of slavery, the domestic slave trade that moved 1 million enslaved people from the Upper South to the Cotton South between 1790 and 1860. As one of the largest slaveholding counties in Virginia, in an area transitioning from tobacco growing to more diversified farming, Albemarle County was a major exporter of enslaved people, and the cotton frontier of the Arkansas Delta was a major destination point of the trade. Slaves toiling in the Deep South had little chance for escape until the Union Army penetrated the Delta during the Civil War. When federal troops occupied Pine Bluff, Arkansas in the fall of 1863, Matthew Gardner joined the thousands of Black Arkansans who flocked to the recruiting stations that the Union Army set up. His regiment's primary assignment was garrison duty in the Vicksburg, Mississippi region. 
garrisoned troops, conducted raids and expeditions and counterinsurgency warfare. They enforced emancipation. They dislodged rebel guerrilla resistance. In Vicksburg, of course, once a bastion of the Confederacy before Grant's famous campaign, USCT troops helped establish an infrastructure of black schools and churches and businesses among the freed people. In other words, Gardner's service mattered a great deal. After the war, Matthew Gardner returned to Pine Bluff and worked as a sharecropper. He initially applied for a veteran's pension in the summer of 1890, and his claims were repeatedly rejected until in 1897, he finally secured a minimal monthly payment of $6 for his heart disease. Now, as Gardner's case illustrates, Black veterans faced many obstacles in applying for pensions, among them poverty, illiteracy, and the racism of pension bureau agents. Due to inferior medical provisions, uh, medical care, including access to vaccines, Black soldiers died of disease at a higher rate than white ones in the Union Army. And those Black veterans who survived bouts with disease and were left chronically ill often found it difficult to provide documents tracing their disabilities to their wartime service. This meant that Gardner's monthly pension sum was a small fraction of the payments received by soldiers who could trace their disabilities directly to the war, easier to do, for example, in the case of a wound than the after effects of disease. Gardner tried in vain to prove that his primary ailment of heart disease originated during his military service. Now, from the start, Gardner's case was clouded by questions about his identity. He tried to explain to Pension Bureau officials the discrepancy between the name he enlisted under, Matthew Berry, a name assigned him by his Arkansas master, and the surname, Gardner, that he went by after the war when he applied for his pension. Gardner had been his father's name back in Virginia. Such discrepancies were not unusual. USCT men who fled slavery often used aliases or uh, when they enlisted or opted to cast off slaveholder assigned names once they achieved freedom. In his pension application, Gardner called on fellow veterans to testify that Matthew Berry and Matthew Gardner were one and the same man. Gardner's journey points up one of the most fascinating and salient facts about our sample of 256 soldiers and sailors. None of them enlisted here in Alamaro County, Virginia. The Union Army didn't make inroads here until the very end of the war. Instead, fascinatingly, the Albemarle, Albemarle men enlisted in 95 different regiments across the North and South in the places they had been dispersed by sail, by forced migration and by flight, and in places in which the wartime presence of the Union Army increased the chances of successfully reaching freedom. So in other words, this BVIB story is a story of a sort of Virginia diaspora. Now, typically scholars classify USCT soldiers by the state in which they enlisted. And by that measure, most black troops came from Louisiana where the Union Army had some early victories and began recruiting early in the war. But if we classify troops by their birthplace, a very different picture emerges. As the largest slaveholding state and because of its centrality to the domestic slave trade, Virginia looms large as the beginning point of the stories of black troops, of these complex journeys to points of enlistment and then outward again uh, across the landscape of the Civil War. The perilousness of these journeys is further illustrated by the case of Solomon Perkins, who enlisted in the second USCT in Washington DC in 1863. Perkins was born in 1839 in the Stony Point neighborhood of Albemarle County and was owned by a, a man named Jacob Moon. When Moon's daughter Louisa married a man named Timoleon Trice in 1845, Perkins was bequeathed to Trice. Three years later, Trice moved Perkins to Louisa County, Virginia, separating young Solomon from his Albemarle kin. During the war, Trice hired Perkins out to work on the Virginia Central Railroad, a key artery that ran through Louisa County. Perkins was one of thousands of enslaved laborers who worked on railroads during the Civil War and, and, and uh, before it too, grading tracks, building bridges, blasting tunnels, and, and so on. The Virginia Central Railroad was a, an especially crucial Confederate asset as it conveyed supplies and troops from the Shenandoah Valley to Lee's army in the east. And knowing this, 
The Federal Army targeted this railroad in a series of audacious raids. And these raids in turn made the railroad a vector of freedom for fugitive slaves who followed the Union raiders uh, back to federal lines as they withdrew there. Solomon Perkins escaped in just this way in August of 1863. Uh, and then uh, uh, after a Union raid on the railroad depot in, in Louisa, and a year later, he, he joined the Union ranks August 1863 again in Washington, DC. Now we should recognize that slaveholders tried everything they could to discourage and preempt such flight, meeting out terrible punishments to those who were suspected or caught or moving or hiding slaves as the federal army encroached. Indeed, Timoleon Trice, Perkins's owner, was arrested by the Union Army in May of 1863 during another raid on Louisa because he had hidden his slaves and refused to tell the Union Army where they were hidden. Perkins, of course, had already fled and avoided Trice's ruse, but making it to Union lines was just the beginning of another perilous chapter, as fugitives who enlisted then took on the dangers of life as soldiers. And this brings me to another key theme. Just as the presence of the Union Army could bring freedom into view, freedom receded where the Union Army lost ground. Confederate policy was to enslave or execute captured black soldiers rather than treating them as prisoners of war to be paroled or exchanged. In March of 1865, Perkins's regiment, the second USCT, while deployed in Florida, led a charge at the Battle of Natural Bridge near Tallahassee. Perkins was seriously wounded and as the official records put it, quote, unavoidably left in the hands of the enemy, unquote, where he died. Whether he died of his wounds or was executed by his Confederate captors is unclear. It is clear that Perkins had risked both his freedom and his life by moving with his regiment into the deepest reaches of Confederate territory. Now these stories again collectively demonstrate that while black Union soldiers had much in common with their white counterparts, black soldiering was also in some key respects distinct. All Union soldiers left their families behind and risked wounds and death and imprisonment but black Union soldiers, very journeys to the army were especially fraught and their separations from family whom they so often had to leave behind in enemy territory were especially daunting. Enslaved people flew, uh, uh, fled in such great numbers because they knew whatever the personal risks might be, their collective withdrawal from slavery would undermine the institution. And this is true even in the four slaveholding border states that did not secede and that were therefore exempt from Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. There too, slave flight eroded slavery. And USCT soldiers from Albemarle County provide a window into this process too through the story of the Carter family of Missouri. 25 of the Albemarle men in black regiments in our BVIB sample were enslaved by, by the Carters, John Coles Carter, a descendant of one of the wealthiest families in colonial Virginia with vast estates in Albemarle County centered at Carter's Mountain. As such estates were subdivided among successive generations, slaveholders looked west for additional lands to turn into plantations. John Coles Carter uh, inherited 1,500 acres in Missouri from his mother, and he migrated from Virginia to Missouri in 1852 with more than 120 enslaved people in tow. John Coles Carter settled in Missouri's so-called Little Dixie, a plantation belt near other slaveholding migrants from Virginia. On December 7th, 1863, Daniel W. Carter, 26 years old, fled John Coles Carter's plantation and made his way to the Union Army recruiting station at Troy, Missouri, joining the 62nd USCT Regiment. A few days later, he was followed by Lewis Carter, Warner Carter, and four others who enlisted in the 65th USCT. In subsequent waves, more and more enslaved men from the Carter plantation headed to Union recruiting stations and signed on as soldiers. And we can't emphasize enough that these acts of localized resistance reverberated at the highest levels of government. Again, all of this resistance mattered. That flight of Missouri slaves to Union lines, over 8,000 in all, helped to convince many white Missourians that slavery had reached its limit. And on January 11th, 1865, a Missouri Constitutional Convention abolished slavery. This was a political development that had seemed inconceivable at the beginning of the war. 
Now, so far I focused on union recruits who escaped slavery during the war, but representatives of Albemarle County's small pre-war population of freed blacks also entered the lists as union soldiers. On the eve of the Civil War, there were roughly 600 free people of color in Albemarle County. They made up about 4% of the black population. And the stories of two families, the Evans family and the Garland family, can serve to illustrate how free blacks fought to claim the full measure of citizenship rights. These families illustrate, too, the centrality of African-American women as unionists to the BVIB project. The sacrifices of the Evans family come to light in the pension application of Frances Evans, a free black washerwoman in Charlottesville. From a fascinating family, her grandmother, Chloe, had won a freedom suit based on her Native American ancestry and established the family's freedom in that way. Now, after the Civil War, Frances Evans saw pension payments as her son, William Evans, had died in combat. Parents of a deceased soldier could claim support if they could prove that they had been dependent for their subsistence on that soldier. As Frances Evans, the mother in this case, related to the Pension Bureau, her own mother, Nancy, had migrated to the free state of Ohio before the war to join a community of other black Virginian migrants there. And in 1855, Frances had sent her then eight-year-old son, William, to join his grandmother in Ohio near Chillicothe. Fast forward to the war. In June of 1863, young William, at age 16, joined the Union Army. He told recruiters that he was 18 and he enlisted in Company E of the 5th USCT uh, there in Chillicothe, Ohio. The decision to enlist carried William Evans back to Virginia where he was killed in action in the Battle of Newmarket Heights on September 29, 1864, a Union victory in which black troops launched a crucial assault on Robert E. Lee's Richmond fortifications. In 1867, a few years after William's death, his mother Frances traveled from Charlottesville to Washington, D.C. to file her pension request. For more than a decade, she would submit and resubmit her application with her supporters here in Albemarle County testifying that she was, quote, in bad health and giving way under the heavy work she has to perform in order to make a living, as her friends put it. But Frances's application was denied because she didn't have sufficient documentation proving that she had depended on her son financially before and during the war. Now, such documentation might include letters a soldier sent home with his paycheck enclosed, for example. But as Frances Evans explained with palpable frustration, because she spent the war in Confederate territory in Charlottesville, a place the Union Army did not reach, her son had no way of contacting her while he was in the army to send such paychecks home. The Pension Bureau conceded in its finding that Frances Evans was uh, caught in a sort of catch-22. Her failure to prove her dependence on her son sprang not only from geography, but from the fact that her son was so young when he enlisted and when he died in battle that he hadn't yet had the chance to support his mother. An equally revealing story can be found in the pension file of James Henry Garland. Garland was born in the early 1840s and emancipated in the 1857 will of Charlottesville merchant Thomas Grady. The teenage Garland and his mother then left Virginia for Pennsylvania to join a community of free blacks in Mercer County, Pennsylvania. After arriving there in, in Pennsylvania, James Garland attended school. He trained to be a barber. In 1863, he opened his own barber shop and married a young woman named Mary Jackson. He then enlisted in the Union Army in the summer of 1864. He joined the 127th USCT Regiment. It trained at Philadelphia's famous Camp William Penn and was then sent to the Virginia Front. In other words, like Jesse Coles and Frank Lee and William Evans, Garland risked his freedom to return to the site of his enslavement to liberate others. As his later pension application discloses, Garland fell ill in the winter of 1864-65. He was detailed with some other soldiers to build a bridge across the James River, exposed to the elements, uh, water, cold, and so on. He was hospitalized and diagnosed with rheumatism, which at the time was a sort of catch-all phrase to cover a wide range of musculoskeletal diseases and joint inflammation. His disease presented 
as a debilitating swelling of his legs, but Garland remembered that he had been so ill in that winter of 1864-65 while building the bridge that he had lost his hearing and power of speech uh, for a time. He was hospitalized during the dramatic spring 1865 campaign, the Appomattox campaign in which his regiment, the 127th participated, but he rejoined them thereafter and did a tour of duty on the Texas frontier. Garland was honorably discharged in Texas in the fall of 1865. After the war, Garland returned to Pennsylvania and he attempted to restart his career as a barber only to be dogged by ill health and chronic pain. In November of 1888, he applied for a pension and he compiled a model pension file. It contained testimonials from a local constable, a lawyer, a doctor, a justice of the peace, his bunkmates from the 127th Regiment, all testify that Garland had been a healthy man before the war, but had come home crippled and in constant pain. The pension agent in charge of his case found that Garland was, quote, a general favorite with the best people in the towns where he lived, unquote, and granted him a pension for war incurred disabilities, rheumatism, and heart disease. Garland's woes were not over, however. His mental health and his physical health sharply deteriorated in his old age. He was so incapacitated that his wife Mary moved to Ohio to be near the couple's adult son, Charles, and she assumed the legal role of, as guardian of James and his estate. Finding James's $17 a month pension payment to be woefully insufficient, she applied in 1909 for an increase in his pension. And she enlisted the help of a remarkable, a dynamic pioneering pension lawyer in Washington, DC, none other than Jeanette Carter a leading black club woman, a labor organizer, journalist, and suffragist. Carter herself encountered obstacles in working on this case. The Pension Bureau initially tried to suggest that Carter wasn't accredited for such work and then had to back down when she proved that she was. Carter skillfully gathered depositions from witnesses in all the places that the family had lived who specified that James Henry Garland's mental impairments were the consequences of his war-induced uh, physical aff afflictions. They testified too that Mary Garland's own health had been impaired by the burden of caring for her very ill husband. Thanks to Jeanette Carter's expert aid, Mary Garland secured an increase in James's pension to $30 a month. But the Garland family's pension odyssey had one last dramatic chapter. When James died of pneumonia in 1918, Mary applied for a widow's pension. And although there was a vast written record in all of these previous filings and depositions and affidavits of her long-term care for her veteran husband, the Pension Bureau refused to recognize her legal widowhood because she couldn't provide a wedding certificate authenticating the couple's 1863 marriage, all this time later in 1918. Mary obtained testimonials from individuals who had attended their wedding in Mercer County, Pennsylvania. Surely that would satisfy the Pension Bureau, but Pension Bureau officials declared those testimonials invalid because the family now lived in Ohio and no longer lived in Pennsylvania. The Garland's son, Charles, a successful insurance agent in Cleveland, stepped in, writing a series of utterly exasperated letters to the local Republican Congressman William Emerson asking for his help and decrying the pension office's delaying tactics. How was it, Charles asked, that a widow of 77 years of age whose husband served in a revolution, as he eloquently put it, could receive such indifferent attention from the government? The bureaucrats, Charles Garland charged, were seeking refuge in arbitrary lines of argument redolent of the Jim Crow discrimination in the South. Charles eventually prevailed in securing a widow's pension for his mother, but it had taken decades of effort. James Garland, the veteran, is buried in an unmarked grave alongside many other USCT soldiers in Cleveland's Woodland Cemetery. In 2012, a USCT monument was erected at this burial site and bears his name. There is no monument here in central Virginia to Garland and his comrades in arms, but their lives to quote Frank Lee are a monument to truth. These soldiers complex journeys into the Union Army, their wartime sacrifices, their post-war struggles for recognition were all forms of protest against Southern slavery and American racism. Here in Albemarle County and across the South, these protests met with a vicious and violent backlash from Confederate whites who refused to give up their lost cause. 
In the aftermath of Reconstruction, defiant white Southerners not only sought to disfranchise and segregate and terrorize Black veterans, they also sought to erase them from the history books. One could never glean listening to the dedication speeches at the Lee and Jackson statue unveilings here in Charlottesville in the 1920s, that African-Americans had outnumbered whites in Albemarle County during the Civil War era, or that this majority experienced the Union Army's arrival in the city in March of 1865 as a moment of liberation. One could never glean that 256 men, black men with Albemarle roots fought in the federal military for the causes of freedom and union or glean that those who survived the war laid the groundwork during the nadir period at the turn of the century for the modern freedom struggle. The Lost Cause Creed and the Confederate statues that memorialized it were meant to sweep that history away. We owe it to these brave Union soldiers to finally give them their due. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Varen. And now we are going to hear from Dr. William Kurtz. Dr. Kurtz is the NOW Center's Managing Director and Digital Historian. He is the author of Excommunicated from the Union, How the Civil War Created a Separate Catholic America, and the editor of David P. Cunningham's Soldiers of the Cross, The Authoritative Text, The Heroism of Catholic Chaplains and Sisters in the American Civil War. And he has recently published an article in the Albemarle County Magazine titled Black Virginians in Blue, the Untold Stories of Albemarle County's U.S. Colored Troops. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kurtz. Thank you very much, Carrie, for that introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here today. It's very exciting for us to finally get to show you the website. And here it is. Uh, we've given so many talks about this project. We've just heard a wonderful talk from Dr. Barron. And so I'm just going to give you the, the basic tour of the website so that we can get to your questions that you might have about uh, the, what Dr. Varen said or about what I'll show you right now. So Black Virginians in Blue is, is a project that started back in 2016. I want to say it was uh, Dr. Varen's idea. Uh, in fact, and it benefited from some early research by a local historian, uh, the guru of all things Civil War local, uh, Irvin Jordan, who works in the Special Collections Library, who's just a wonderfully generous and shared his initial research into this question of how many, or were there any local black men who were Union sailors or soldiers? And in fact, we found out that there were 256 men who enlisted in the Union Army or Navy, 250 in the Army, in the uh, US Colored Troops, and six in the Navy. And then what started out as a Civil War project really became uh, a project about African American history in the 19th century, a social history. Uh, we, it was really important to me that in writing biographies of these men, uh, that we also inc included a lot of details about their family, their, their nuclear families. So we wrote biographies, not just of the men, but of their uh, spouses as well. We wanted to give you those individual biographies and essays to put those individual stories in context, just like Dr. Varen did so eloquently. And then we also wanted to, you know, not just give you our version of the story, like our distilled biography, our essay that we compiled from the evidence, we have probably tens of thousands of images, 10,000 images or so of photos that we took at the National Archives or we've downloaded uh, of service records or newspapers, et cetera. And we just put up a selection of the, the best that really give you the voice of the, these people. So it's not just me telling you what happened to um, James T.S. Taylor, you get to hear his voice as well. So with that being said, let me uh, go through the website. So the first place you're gonna wanna go uh, is probably right here to the people search. And this will, if you, you know someone you, you want to, to research, uh, if you know uh, someone um, uh, of a regiment that you were interested in, so like how many of these men are in the 54th? Well, 
There's actually only one man who was in the 54th from Albemarle County, um, and he enlisted too late to be involved in the famous Battle of Fort Wagner, which is in the movie Glory. But there were a lot of men who were in the 55th. Uh, which, and you can search here for, you can select for just the men, you can select just for the, the women, you can uh, search for the, the children as well. Uh, you can search on where they enlisted, when they enlisted, uh, some basic data like that. So let me just pull up all the soldiers for us, just to give you a sense of what you're going to find when you do this search. So we've done a search for soldiers, and let's go to the very first one, John Adams. Now, John Adams, that's a very common name, very difficult to find a name like that in genealogical re, uh, resources. Uh, and so for a number of these men, uh, we have only been able to trace what they did during the Civil War. So they have very, very short biographies, uh, just, just basically when they came in and when they left. So there's still more work to be done. This project will never quite ever be done. Uh, there's, there's more work to be done to find out, well, if we can, what John Adams' story was before and after the Civil War. Now, if I go back and let's go to, uh, there are 250 of them, so just give, uh, bear with me for a second. If we go to one of the men that Dr. Varon talked about in her talk, Jesse uh, Coles or the Reverend Coles, and this is a much longer biography, and in part because we have a pension record for him. We don't have a pension record for John Adams. We have a pension record for uh, Reverend Coles. And so we're able to trace him after the war. The pension records, as Dr. Barron said, are really wonderfully rich resources for post-war history, the post-war history of the family, not just the soldier. Um, but sometimes they also reveal a lot of great detail about the, the, the soldier's antebellum life too, and maybe even his wife's antebellum life as well. So I mean, those are just such rich resources. You will be able to tell right away, okay, they had a pension record for that one because that's a really amazing biography. Um, if we, this is actually an image of, of uh, Reverend Coles from uh, a newspaper published during his lifetime. There are several images of, images of him. We only have images of a, a handful of our men. You'll see, I'll get to this in just a second. Some of them have document links at the bottom of the biographies and that's uh, those primary sources I was mentioning earlier, those, those sources where we get at the, vo the voices of the actual men themselves. And then if you keep scrolling down past the written biography, you're gonna get the database. And the database pretty much is the same kind of data you're gonna get up in the biography we wrote, uh, except a little bit more standardized, uh, very regular. And it's kind of cool because you can see the connections very easily uh, in, the, in the database. You can see, uh, okay, here, his wife was Nancy, his, he was the parent to uh, Etha and Clara uh, Coles. And so it's just basically, this is the database content is what's driving that search on the initial search page. So Coles is a person who shows up all over our, all over our website. He's a very prominent, very important, very inspirational. Uh, he has a very inspirational story. Let me move on to, so if you, you want to, you know, look up people by regiment, by name, things like that, and see if we have a biography about them, um, you know, you're, you're looking up your ancestor, like, uh, is there a Battles or something like that? Is there, is there a man named Battles? Uh, you, you can do that on the people page, but maybe you're sort of interested in, I kind of want to see where these men entered the army. What's that story look like? And so we have a map to let you do that. Now, the more you zoom in, there aren't really 127 people enlisting right in this one spot. The more you zoom in though, those numbers uh, get smaller and smaller. And then you start to get these little points on the map. And if you click on one of those points, here we have John Adams again, John Adams 30th Regiment Infantry enlisted in Wilmington, uh, March 3rd, 1865. And this link right here will take you right to John Adams's biography. Let's go to muster out real quick. No, I'm, and the muster out is sort of the same thing, except it has a little bit more detail. Uh, it shows movement over time. That where men enlisted is not necessarily where they mustered out. Uh, there's also more reasons for mustering out. Like, why did you leave the army? Uh, you might've left it for several reasons. You might've uh, just served your full term and you're done. You might've been discharged for disability. You might've been captured or, 
in 72 cases, you might have died during the Civil War. 72 of our 256 men, 72 of our 250 soldiers, to be precise. All the, all the deaths are, are soldiers, and none of them are sailors during the war. Uh, that's a staggering uh, figure, about 28%, 28% death rate, which is uh, far above the overall USUT mortality rate, actually. So these men really are our subset of the larger USUT story. These men really suffered and really uh, gave the last full measure uh, on behalf of saving the Union and ending slavery. Moving quickly here, I told you about the contextual essays. It was really important for us to have essays that put those individual biographies into context. You know, sometimes we don't have as much details we want about an individual, but we do know something about the regiment. We can place them in the context of their regiment story. We can place them in the context of uh, the story of other people who enlisted in the same areas. So for example, people who enlisted in Ohio, Pennsylvania, or maybe who enlisted in Vicksburg, something like that. What you're going to want to do here is you're going to want to go to our overview essays, which are at the very top of the essay list. And the first three are written by an undergraduate. In fact, most of the essays on this site are written by undergraduates, peer reviewed or reviewed, I should say, uh, for quality and, and um, accuracy by myself, uh, doctors uh, Varen, Janie, and uh, Gallagher, uh, Dr. Gallagher, when he was, uh, who's now our former director, of course. These overview essays will give you a sense of what life was like for th these men, our Albemarle uh, USCT men and black sailors before the war, during the war, after the war. And then we have a few more overview essays that are all about the larger African-American experience. Those are all done by Frank Cirillo, a recent graduate of our PhD program. If you've seen those overview essays and you don't want to, you want to select something else, what you can do is you can just unclick the kind of essay you don't want to, you don't want to see anymore. If you click it, you'll get it back again, or you refresh the page. Uh, and if we do that, we can isolate essays that are about battles. So now if you're interested in, I'm curious about all the men uh, in your group who fought at the Battle of the Crater, here they are. We have uh, about a half dozen essays about the most important battles that our Albemarle men were involved in. The crater. A lot of these battles take place as part of the Petersburg campaign, the Battle of Chaffin's Farm, or Newmarket Heights, as Dr. Varen referred to it. The little known battle of Honey Hill, which was part of a diversion in support of William Sherman's March to the Sea. Uh, the, the smashing success in 1864 of the Battle of Nashville by a Virginian uh, born general, a Union general named George H. Thomas. That's all right here. So you can get, uh, we also have essays about uh, African American family life, about dis disease, about the high mortality rate that I mentioned earlier. We, and for some of our really prominent people, uh, especially James T.S. Taylor, who was very important in Charlottesville uh, politics after the war, who was a, a leader of the black community, a leader of the black uh, political community in Charlottesville. Uh, we have an essay uh, just about him as well. Now, if we go to the next section and we're looking at documents, I've, we've transcribed and proofread about 60 or so documents. There's plenty more to add. As I told you, there's you know, thousands and thousands of images, but these are sort of the highlights. I tried to choose a selection that, was, that had an interesting story to tell that were told in the voice of the people uh, themselves when possible, or if it was something like, uh, an obituary in a newspaper. What did what did the community think of these people? So trying to get at different perspectives of of this experience of this story through these these records. My hope is that you know, students who are writing research papers about this will use these uh, sources in combination with other parts of the website, and uh, they could. I mean, they could pretty much write a research paper based upon all of the all of the sources that we've made available. All those sources um, being linked uh, to essays as well. So, if I just do a quick search for Garland, sorry, uh, James H. Garland, Dr. Barron mentioned him in her talk. Here is his testimony, his pension testimony. Not all pension testimonies are this this rich. Not all pension testimonies are this long. 
but it's amazing the amount of detail it goes into. Some of those service records, the military service records can be very bare bones. It's basically, you know, did anything interesting happen to this person in a two month period? And usually uh, there's not a lot of detail, but he goes into great detail about what he did during the Civil War, how he contracted his disease, why he needs his, his pension, um, all, all of the doctors you saw after the war. Uh, it's really uh, amazing some of the, the details that you can get in the voices of, of these people them, themselves, not just, not just an historian distilling it for you. This is their voice. This is them speaking to us uh, and telling us their story. I think it's, um, and I think there's, we are currently transcribing even more sources to put up as well because there are just so many, I could only choose the highlight uh, to get them in, ready in time for the website launch. But I think there are, are even, even more and we are very happy of course, to share additional resources too if people would like to see them. The last thing is the search feature right here. If you, want to just search across everything, you said, okay, well, I don't want to just look at people or just the stories or just the documents, show me everything. If I do a search for Taylor, I get James T.S. Taylor, here's his biography. Here are some uh, letters that he wrote. Uh, he wrote a series of letters that we, I've been blogging on our website to the Anglo-African American detailing the, the story of his regiment. And then finally, uh, if I go right here, you'll see we, it's also pulling from essays. So here's that essay I told you about. This essay was the very first thing ever written uh, publicly by about our project. It was written by an historian named Jonathan W. White from Christopher Newport University, who's extremely generous and was working on this for his own book, which is just now coming out. But he shared this letter with us. And it is an amazing letter that Taylor writes to President Abraham Lincoln explaining why he ran away uh, what his ser and what his service was like during the Civil War, absolutely amazing letter. I'm afraid to say there's only one such letter from our 256 men to President Lincoln. The final page, just really quickly, because I know I'm running a little bit over here, and that is uh, just the about section. And that tells you about the history of the project and all the people who worked on it. I'd like to thank especially the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities for their technical support, the Jefferson Trust uh, for the, a grant that was vital for the completion of this project are of course our founder John L. Now the third and the and the generous support of our directors past and present uh, Dr. Barron, Dr. Janey and, and Dr. Gallagher. Uh, without them this project would not have been successfully completed. It took a lot of people to uh, finish finish it and to make it what it is today and it's something that can continue to grow. There can continue to be more people discovered, more information, better biographies, more essays I just want to close briefly by thanking all of the many UVA undergraduates who helped us out over the years. Thank you so much. I'm only going to name those who worked for us this year as a representative example. Uh, Marvin Hicks, Cole Davidson, Seth Stowe, and Annie Valentine. Annie Valentine's been with us for two whole years uh, working on this project. And so I just want to thank you all. And I want to thank Brian Newman, a recent graduate of the PhD program for his help and a recent and a current graduate student named uh, Ian Iverson, who's been helping out as well. Uh, these are only a few of the many people that I should thank, but I only have so much time. So thank you all very much. I look forward to your questions. We'll publish the URL for the website in the chat and I'll send it out via our social media as well after today's event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will, for that wonderful presentation. I was going to begin by asking about where they could find the URL. So you'll send it out, but it will also be available through the Now Center website? Yes, I can do that. I can, I'll can. i put it up on the website, I'll put it up on social media, and I will have it out through our e-newsletter if that's the way you choose to get uh, tuned into the Now Center. So it'll be everywhere. Okay, so we're gonna start taking some questions from the audience now. And we'll start with the first question that we, we might wanna talk a bit about tomorrow night, but I'll ask both Drs. Behrens and Kurtz to address this. Are there ways to recover the lives of black Southerners during the war who did not become soldiers and therefore did not have pension records? So men, women, children who might've fled to union lines and served in other roles beyond just soldiers or sailors. 
That, that's a great question and such an important one. And as, and as you said, um, Tomorrow night we'll have some of the, the great experts on this question who will who, who you'll you'll uh, you'll you'll interview and and we'll hear from. But but in the meantime, yes, it's essential to understand that the kind of resistance I refer to the flight uh, uh, enlisting in the Union Army is part of a broad spectrum of of contributions of African Americans to the Union war effort. Uh, resistance, large scale and small scale, was absolutely essential, and, and we have a, a huge range of sources for getting it uh, at non-combatants, uh, both primary sources and a very wonderful, rich scholarship. And just just to give a few examples, we do have some letters and diaries and memoirs from African-American women from the Civil War, Charlotte Fortin, the teacher who went south to teach free people, uh, Susie King Taylor, a camp follower who became a nurse, Elizabeth Keckley and Harriet Jacobs, very uh, uh, storied women, fascinating lives who did relief work for, for freed, uh, freed people, uh, uh, relief work was the sort of term at the time for sort of charitable uh, uh, work. And, and um, these are, sources among many others that uh, scholars like Thivolia Glimpf draw on. We had a wonderful Now Center event with her this past fall. One of the many important points uh, in her scholarship is that, um, uh, is that as, as important as those who fled to Union lines are, we also have to think about those who didn't flee, who for whatever reason, uh, the Union Army never came near their, their communities, didn't penetrate the region of the South they were in, they, they chose uh, other forms of resistance that were, that were just as important in destabilizing slavery. There's also a rich uh, um, literature on, on um, the destinations of refugees in the so-called contraband camps uh, that the Union Army set up. And I'm sure that we'll hear, uh, you know, learn a lot more about that tomorrow night. But, but yes, it's a it's very, very important theme. And, and again, uh, you know, as, as, as Will said, um, our, our, we're very proud of the essays and the, particularly the student work on, on the website, but it's, it's the tip of the iceberg in terms of the interpretive possibilities of the material we've presented. And particularly, there's so much in each of these pension files about families and about women and about marriage and about you know, family relationships, so much there to be recovered. Thank yes. you. Yeah, that's absolutely right. If I could uh, uh, just briefly say, it's amazing that you can recreate um, these African-American communities through the pension records, especially the pension records from the Carter family. You see the same people over and over again testifying. There's a, there's a, a woman named Nancy Red who must be like the community's historian, local historian basically, because she knows everything about everybody and she's the person that they went to to uh, corroborate information. You know, I, I, I need to prove I was married to this person in this state and she's, constantly testifying. So um, yeah, you do, you do get uh, uh, certainly soldiers testifying on behalf of soldiers, but you get the community showing up as well. And that's, I think, why so many of our men were successful in their pension records. I mean, 93% of them got pension records, which is much larger than uh, other studies have shown. Other studies by uh, Donald Schaefer says that about 75% of Black pension applications were successful, 75, only 75%, 93% of ours were really speaks to their suffering. And I think it also speaks to that community, especially in that, that the, the former Carter plantations. I think the community rallied together and, and they, they got it done. They got, they, they got the support that they needed, at least part of it. So here's another question. Have you established relationships with descendants? Are they involved in shaping the project and will their stories be incorporated? We have only heard from a few descendants so far. Uh, we have been very blessed to have had de descendants from the Taylor family, not directly from James, but of the Taylor family in attendance at our past talks for Liberation and Freedom Day. I just met a descendant of the Coles family uh, about a month ago. And so he was extremely thrilled to hear about the research that we had been doing, but also research that had been going on up in Pennsylvania Reverend Coles died in uh, York, Pennsylvania. And so, you know, we hope to keep building on that. We hope to keep building those relationships and, uh, you know, sharing what we have. And then hopefully people will also, you know, uh, continue to share with us. We've been very uh, fortunate in that a lot of people, local genealogists included who 
heard about what we're doing and have volunteered more information or said, hey, you've oh, there's another person you should know about. You should, uh, and, and for example, just a month ago, we just found our 256th Black Virginian in blue. And that was, uh, he was given to us by a local researcher. Um, so we're, we're just, people have been very, very generous with us. Professor Varon, can you talk a bit more about the payments made to Black Union soldiers? Do the pension records give you a sense of how Black soldiers entered into the period of freedom economically? That's, that's a great question. And, and um, we do, it, it, I haven't made a systematic study of this, but it's a great question because it's precisely the sort of question that these pension records could, uh, could, could, um, could answer. Again, there were you know, discrepancies in, in the sort of uh, uh, pensions men um, were able to secure based on a whole number of factors, the nature of their ailments, the degree to which there were sympathetic doctors uh, in the, the vicinity who would testify honestly about the natures, the nature of those, uh, of those ailments. There were financial transactions involved with securing a pension. Sometimes men reached out uh, to lawyers and, uh, uh, and, and, and others to help them navigate uh, navigate the, uh, the the bureaucracy. Um, so I, 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 you know, and one of the most interesting questions here gets back to what you all were just discussing. This is very much a Virginia story and an Albemarle story in a sense, but it, it also isn't. It, it's so much more than that. The James Taylor, the remarkable individual who uh, Will referred to as one of the few men who returns to Albemarle County. And, and he's fascinating not only because he writes a letter to Lincoln and wrote letters to a New York paper, which we have preserved, but he also becomes a, a political leader in this community after the war. So, so people here know uh, of him. And we've been able to, again, be in touch uh, with, uh, with descendants. But most of the men in these 200, among the 256, didn't come back to Virginia, they went to other places to settle. And, and one of the things we'll, researchers will need to ask as we pose questions like the one that we've just heard is how can we sort of disaggregate this sample? What was the different fate of men who had been, um, for example, in the rank and file and those who become non-commissioned officers, corporals or sergeants? How, how do we compare the post-war prospects of men who went to the South after the war to settle and men who went to the North, of men who had been free before the war, men that became free during the war and so on. But, but I think questions about their economic uh, fortunes are, are answerable with this material, but that's not something we've done a systematic study of yet. And Professor Penhiro will probably talk a bit about that tomorrow night uh, when he talks about the, the families from Philadelphia in particular. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, will, could you talk a, a, a bit, we've had a couple of questions about whether other counties and other places in Virginia are doing similar types of projects. Could you elaborate on that? I only know of a few who, who are. Um, there might be a lot of people who are doing them, but they just, uh, haven't made them widely as widely known as we would like. I know that down in uh, Rockbridge County th that um, one of our local historians, Cinder Stanton, is working on something along these lines. And then there's actually an effort up in Culpeper County to, they just broke ground on a monument to their local USCT troops. So, you know, I hope that uh, people see those efforts and our effort and they're inspired to do the same thing across the rest of the state of Virginia. And across uh, the South as well, because there's just a, a lot of, you know, people don't, um, I think because the USCT story, those stories are held often in the National Archives and they're not necessarily, those records aren't necessarily local, right? That uh, sometimes people forget about that story. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, what we've done is to show them how to do it, how to say, okay, I wanna do the local black soldier and sailor story of my, my area, um, this, this is how you do it. I'll just jump in there and say, you know, to, to build on what Will has said that, you know, the stakes here are large because what this is an exercise in is reimagining local history. So for years, decades and longer, the notion was that Albemarle County has a Confederate history, but it doesn't have any other history. Right. And, and that's just simply wrong. We, we thought that there was no USCT so, story here because the Union Army didn't recruit here, but there is a USCT story here. And the, so, so there, it is a way of reimagining local history and can be that for many other communities. 
the sort of flip side of that, which is another fascinating question, which is out there for people to explore, is that one of the things that makes the experiences of these African-American troops distinct is, is the centrality of national allegiance in the sense that white soldiers in the Confederate and Union Army often enlisted with into companies with communities and then and then were mustered in with state regiments and there was a very strong community and state allegiance that drove you know motivated their service for so many of these men again the way they were dispersed they really are making a commitment to, to a national army and to and to a national project and and thinking about it sort of you know gets back to will's point again there's a sort of balance here of trying to keep the local and the particularistic in view while also keeping um, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the broad national story in view. And the maps help that just remind us, again, of other ways in which it's a national story. And if I can add one more thing real quick, uh, the uh, lengths that we had to go to to make sure we did our due diligence and search through every single USUT regiment were um, the poor, the undergraduates who were involved in looking through fold three for me through 20,000 different service records, they deserve some kind of star in heaven or, or something yeah. because it was an incredible amount of work. And I spent a whole week going through service records or descriptive books at the National Archives on top of what you can search online on Ancestry, which is only part of the, the whole USCT. Um, but there is a project out of New York that was was or has transcribed all of the service records, all that basic data about where they were born. So if somebody's watching and saying, well, I, I, how do I do that effectively? I can't go to NARA. Well, hopefully soon that data will be public and you'll be able to search it and you'll be able to find your people, your local African-American story, all of those people quickly. You can already do that by going to the Soldiers and Sailors National uh, Park database for the sailors. You can go right there and it has birthplace and it's it's unbelievably easy. Um, there were about 20, 2,800, I think, 2,800, sounds about right, uh, African-American sailors from Virginia. So a staggering number, only six of them are from uh, Albemarle. So, I mean, there's that whole story too, as well. We, we tend to focus on the USCT, but there's a great there's a, there's, a, there's a very large, interesting black sailor story to tell too. And I suspect that that story would be larger and um, more, you know, um, it would just be larger and there'd be more material for people who live on the Eastern mm -hmm. parts of the state. Yeah, and I'll just add, you, you know, that as well as saying these digital humanities projects are sort of force multipliers. They build on each other. This one wouldn't have been possible without Ancestry and Fold3 yeah. and all of the digitized newspaper databases in which we found things like obituaries of someone like Coles that, that we would have been very difficult to access before we had these, these, these digital tools. So, Will, I will close with one um, hopefully quick final question. And that is if people have information about family members, ancestors that were from Albemarle County and they wanna share that information with us, what's the best way for them to go about doing so? That's a great question. So the best way to do that is to email the NOW Center. I will type in the, before we end here, I will type in our NOW Center email address, but just email us with your questions. If you, if you, need information, you want something we have, very happy to share it. If you have information you'd like to share or you'd like to comment on something we've written, please do so. Um, we have benefited so much from everybody's generosity. We wanna uh, continue this dialogue as we uh, you know, keep working on this website. And yeah. I'll just say in closing, I, I can see there are questions we haven't gotten a chance to go to, but there's a part two of this event and, and we hope you all will attend tomorrow night and, 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 uh, and, and you know, pose questions then as well. Yes, so please join us again tomorrow night. Thank you to Dr. Kurtz and Dr. Varen for these fantastic presentations. We will be back at the same time tomorrow night with Amy Taylor, Emmanuel Dabney, and Holly Pinhero to continue our conversation. So until then, have a good evening. Good night, everyone. Good night.